Hey there and welcome back to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I am in Whitehall, Pennsylvania in my little studio called Whitehall Pottery. I'm Heidi Jacobs and today we are going to do a Raku. What's Raku? Well, let's find out. Let's get muddy. As with most pottery projects, it does require a pot. So in this case, I knew that I had several vessels that I was able to take with me, up to six. They could not be any taller than a foot and could not be any wider than 10 inches. And they also asked that no one bring any platters. So I also had to think about the shapes that I wanted to do, as well as what they would be functioning as. For Raku, it's a low fire process, and that basically means that the clay that I'm using will not be vitrified completely in the heating process. The reason I'm using a mid-fire clay is because that it's pretty resistant to shock, and that's very helpful when you're talking about taking something out of a very hot kiln and putting it into combustible materials, which you'll see later. It means that the pot will have less likelihood of breaking. Now what you're seeing me throw here is one of the taller vases. I kept the base and the walls a bit thicker than what I normally do just to help have a little bit more stability in that thermal shock. Hopefully they won't crack as badly or if at all. The next step in the process is to wait for your pieces to dry and then put them in an 04 05 cone bisque fire just like you would prior to a glaze fire. Once they were completely cooled, then I, before the class, ended up deciding that I wanted to apply a silhouette pattern with an octopus. I've got tentacle suction cups <laughs> on my finger. <laughs> it's coming along though, it's taking four freaking ever. And when it was ready to go, I just slapped that sucker right onto the side of the vase and used it as basically a release for whatever glaze I was going to choose to use at the fire. Dan Kuhn, who was the teacher, ended up bringing several of his mixed glazes, and so I didn't really have to think too much about what I wanted to do because we were limited on options. But I knew that I wanted this to have several different characteristics. One of them was that I wanted it to have a burst of color behind the octopus. The octopus would ultimately be black, and then the rest of the vessel leave it to collect that black uh, charcoal look as well. And you'll see after the fire whether that was successful or not. Or if you followed me on social media, you already know. glazes you can put one on top of another on top of another it doesn't really matter bless you they're gonna get muddy right so that was dan dan coon from time pottery and these are my pieces after i've applied the glaze dan's kiln setup was a lot different than the last guy this one was a one-man raku, basically. You could do everything with the kiln itself with one person. Then he had three trash cans set up to the left of the kiln. These had combustible materials, paper, sawdust, that kind of stuff. And he also had a thermometer attached to the outside of the kiln that allowed him to kind of gauge the temperature a, bu a bit more accurate than just kind of watching and seeing what's happening with the glazes. He's using the technology but also peeking in as things get hot. And what he's going to do now is lift the top of the kiln off so that it exposes the pieces. And then he's going to take each piece with a pair of blacksmith tongs and put them into the combustible materials. 
He doesn't want the potter on the outside to close off the lid until he has all of the pieces full. And sometimes he's going to ask for more people to put paper over top so that there is more carbon burn off to create that surface. So that's what Sherry just did there. She flipped the lid, closed the lid with paper on the inside of the lid so that all of that paper would burn up inside the vacuum. All of the carbon burn off then pushes into the piece or sucks into the piece because of the vacuum and creates those final textures that you get from the flash with the glaze that you've chosen. Dan does not speed cool the pieces with water. He just leaves them in the can for about 15 minutes and then opens the lid and then we sit them on the ground to air cool. The initial kiln load takes a bit longer to heat up because you're starting from a cool kiln but each consecutive fire gets rapidly faster because of all of that heat. Depending on how quickly you can load and unload the kiln, obviously you're gonna conserve heat. But in this case, it was about 45 minutes for the pieces to get hot enough to put into the trash cans. And again, he was using technology to our advantage by being able to measure the temperature instead of just having to keep peeking in. I'll just let it go and you guys can watch the process. Dan was being deliberate in the pieces that he was selecting. One, size, two, what glazes were used. If a matte glaze was used, he was putting that in faster because in order to get the benefits of using the matte yep. glaze that he had mixed, this, you have to put it in while too. it's still really hot. For the crackle right. glazes, you want the air to hit it They're not uh, enough so and it to cool have to worry fast about enough it. Just have to be careful in that it. windy air or when you blow on it or when you put a fan on it to get as much crackle as possible. So he loaded my octopus there, I don't know if you noticed, uh, into the kiln, or into the uh, trash can. And it's closed off. It sat there for about 20 minutes while he loaded the other kiln. And here we go, there's my octopus piece right there. Look at it, oh, it's so cute. We all were joking that it was like Christmas every time that he unloaded a can. <laughs> it's gonna be shiny! Dan had a crackle celadon that I used on the octopus, and that's why that little arrow area got a little crackled. But I could not be any more pleased by this piece. I'm so excited to clean it off. And here's my elephant. A lot of what you see is soot that's on there around the face of the elephant and the bottom of the piece on the bottom left. We'll get a little closer and you can see the cracking that's there. That's from the glossy clear glaze. What you're seeing for pigment is from the bisque kiln ware that came out. So that's the pigment of the clay itself that's making that look kind of salmon. This one was a gorgeous piece. This was using copper penny, which was a mix that Dan had brought. And look, little brass bridge. But out of the six pieces, I was able to keep five of them. One of them just, it, it didn't turn out really well. It just kind of went flat and brown. So in the trash can it went, but everything else I'm so happy with. Look at that elephant. So neat. And the octopus. get in for some detail so you can see what the glaze did because that's really the most spectacular part of Raku. 
is that you never really know what you're going to end up with. There are so many different variables that can cause variations in the clay and in the glaze. It truly is like Christmas. Look how shiny. And that texture from the Steve tool just did so much for these pieces as well. Look at that shoulder. So there you have it. That is a Raku fire. It was an amazing day for me. It, it came at the tail end of all of this pandemic stuff where uh, I'm finally vaccinated. So I felt comfortable going into a group of people. Everybody stayed masked the whole time, which was really um, kind for anyone that wasn't vaccinated yet. And, you know, it, it just was so nice. I met so many really wonderful people. It was definitely a needed adventure. And as we joked, it was a nice Mother's Day gift to those of us that have children because it was a day spent away from said children. <laughs> I kid, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> anyway, uh, I hope you guys got informed about the process. I really appreciate Dan's style of teaching. He was very calm. Uh, and very just methodical about the steps and didn't, you know, rush or excite anybody. It was just kind of like, okay, here's the next step. I'm going to do this. You're going to stay there. Here's how you stay safe. And it just, it felt really calm. The day was really relaxing. It was really nice to meet all of those new people and um, see some of my friends from the previous Raku fire. Uh, but again, if you ever are interested in doing a Raku, just look up some of your local potters and some of your local ceramic supply stores. A lot of times potters will be putting on these like informal events and you know, this one was $50 a person. I was able to fire six pieces. I used his glazes and, um, you can't really ask for anything better. I had some really great instruction. I learned a good bit. It was a full day of experience and I took home some really, really precious pieces. So definitely, definitely look into it if you're in the Pittsburgh area, uh, with standard supply or, you know, elsewhere. Again, just look up local potters and, you know, see what kind of classes are available. Well, that's all that I have for you today, and hopefully I'll get better at posting more videos more regularly. Um, the last couple of years has been a bit crazy and tumultuous with my day job, so um, I, I recently decided to leave that role and am pursuing some other things in the background, so hopefully that opens me up to being a little less manic with the uh, workload and be able to focus more on my pottery and share experiences and videos with you as they come along because I know you guys enjoy them and hopefully they're applicable to what you're working on or giving you ideas for some things to work on as well. All right, cheers, take care, and see you next time.